Come on, doesn't matter what campus you're at online, north, south, that's amazing, is it not? I mean, it, it is incredible. See, think about it for a moment. Put yourself in the position. I don't know if you've ever worn a blindfold that utterly impaired your vision. You know, most of them you can kind of see down the bottom, but there are some that are made that utterly take away your vision. I, I've worn them a couple times, didn't last long. I'm too much of a control freak. I imagine for a moment what it'd be like to put those on and then be told at the sound of the gun to run as fast as you can forward, not being able to see a thing. I, I'll be honest with you. I'd rather stand up here and preach in my underwear than do that. And some of you are thinking you'll put extra money in the offering for that not to happen, right? That's a fundraising technique right there. What if, listen to me, what if what you just saw is the way we're intended to live life? And if we live life that way, we can be a people who are fearless. You see, when it comes to the future, let's be honest, we're absolutely blind. It's the reason if you examine our culture, we are very enamored with the future in our culture. We want to know the what of the future so we can prepare for it. I mean, there was a novel written almost a century ago, a little over a century ago, called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, a, a guy by the name of Jules Verne. And he actually foresaw a submarine. And people are still examining his works as they think he might be a prophet and have insights into the what of the future. And if I know the what, I can be prepared. You can go to a 16th century author, some hold him to be a prophet by the name of Nostradamus, and people actually examine his work more closely today than they ever have because they think he had some insights into what might happen into the future. All over the internet right now, you have the ability to look at horoscopes, things that are supposed to tell you about your future. And I ask people sometimes, why do you read them? And they, they say, well, they're just kind of entertainment. So I read a few. They're not very entertaining as far as I can tell. If you've ever not been able to sleep, you young'uns don't know what we're talking about. Us old people, we know. And you kind of flip the television channels and you got the 1-900 numbers and the psychic readings that are happening there and people are making millions of dollars. We want to know the what of the future. There are Jesus followers all over the world right now. Probably some among us right now who are engaging in horoscopes and psychic readings, even though the scripture clearly tells us that astrology and mediums are the doctrine of demons. But why would we do it? Well, we want to know what the future holds. If we know what the future holds, then we can be prepared. And if we're prepared, then we're not afraid. Even in the church, if I mention the word prophecy to you, most of us think future. Honestly, in the New Testament, it really means encouragement more than it means future, but we think future. And I'll be very vulnerable with you. If I ever just want to get a big crowd of people, everybody show up, all I got to do is say, hey, I'm going to do a series on how current events line up with biblical prophecies and how things that are happening today uh, are in line with biblical prophecy. So I just say, hey, what if I was going to tell you next week how the invasion of Ukraine by Russia lines up with biblical prophecy? And you're thinking, man, if that's it, then maybe there's other prophecies that come about. We can go to know the what of the future. Now, you've never heard me do a series like that. Please hear me. There are people who do it. They're awesome, Jesus-loving, Bible-believing people. I just don't agree with them. I'm not, a, I'm not a scholar of history, but I know enough of history to say that Jesus' followers have been lining up prophecy with events of their time, saying this fulfills that for centuries. And all of them have been wrong. I don't think the scripture calls us so much to look at the how and the nature of Jesus' return. I think the big call is this, so what? Listen to me, Jesus is coming back. And from what I can tell in the scripture, I was just reading my regular Bible reading, 1 Thessalonians 5 this morning. And he says, you don't know the dates or the hour, but we are not of those who are unprepared. We need to have a strength and a courage ready for Jesus to come back. Because I'm telling you, it could happen. Right now, wouldn't that not be phenomenal if just somehow in the middle of this, wham, we see him and it's done. It's not that we're just done. Everything we've tasted of the kingdom of God now becomes fulfilled in its totality. Man, in the words of the apostle Paul, Maranatha, Lord Jesus. Maranatha is just a Greek word that means come quickly. Come quickly. See, the biblical teachings about the return of Jesus are supposed to give us strength and courage 
so that we can live today the way we're supposed to live in light of that. See, guys, you get what I say. When it comes to the future, we're blind. And, and we know it. Like most of us probably have a thought of what we're going to do tomorrow. We have an idea. But if you're online right now, you're North Campus, South Campus, this matters not. We also know that things can change dramatically tomorrow. Before it happens, things can change in a snap. I was talking to one of our great elder advisors, Randy Boyd, and we were recounting March of 2020 because he and I were in a hotel in Vienna, Austria. And at 2.30 in the morning, Vienna time, there's a knock on my door and it's Randy Boyd. And I was like, Randy, what's wrong? And he said, the president's just closed down the borders um, in two days. I said, why? He said, COVID. And we were jumping and moving around. I already had my ticket home, but I watched as I got to the airport in Frankfurt and all these people were coming from all over the world and they were turning around trying to get home as quick as they could because everything changed in a moment. And deep down, we know it. And because everything can change in a moment, it causes many, if not most of us, to live in a place of fear. I read in an article this week a new phrase. I love to see new phrases we create to try to describe reality. And sociologists have come up with a phrase called anticipatory anxiety. I mean, we all immediately know what it means. They say no one knows what the future holds and wondering how work, relationship situations will turn out is pretty normal. Or maybe you're concerned about less ordinary events, natural disasters, losing loved ones, a global pandemic. Anticipatory anxiety describes fear and worry around bad things that could happen. It can happen in a lot of different contexts, but it commonly focuses on things you can't predict or control. And right there is the essence of fear, because we feel out of control. The phrase anticipatory anxiety wasn't around years ago, or I hadn't run across of it, when God showed me I had it. It was in a very unlikely spot. Um, for most of our marriage, my wife and I have sought to live by um, biblical wisdom when it comes to finances. Like, we have a budget and we live by it. I know that's a novel thought, isn't it? But we actually do that. Um, when, we, when our children were at home, they're a lot older now, but we had them as teenagers make and keep a budget. I, I hope they still are. I've asked them about it. They tell me it's none of my business. Bunch of ingrates, right? I raised them. My wife and I have always worked to use debt minimally, get out of debt as quickly as we can. That's how we as a church have operated. We believe in radical and generous giving and such. But several years ago, I was reading a book, and the author was talking about living the same way. And I had what the old timers in the church called the witness of the Spirit. Maybe you've never heard that phrase, witness of the Spirit, but I bet you've experienced because you'll be reading something in the Bible. You'll be reading something in a book, and something deep inside of you will go, uh-huh. That's true, not just true. It is true for you. And what he said about himself, I knew was true about me. He said, one day I realized that my motivation for handling money biblically was totally fear-based, not God-honoring. Even though I was handling money responsibly, I was still putting my security and my own abilities to earn and control money so that I would never have to go without anything again. My hope was in material wealth instead of God's rich provision. I can tell you that not only was me, it can easily become me if I don't battle a lot. Now, I don't want you to swing the pendulum here because some of you are thinking, woohoo, Pastor Dave said I don't have to worry about how I handle my money biblically. I'm just going to go out, put it down, here we go. That's not what I'm saying. Handle your money with biblical wisdom. But listen, wisdom isn't a substitute for faith. You can live as wisely as the Bible calls us to. And it will not substitute the idea of faith for what the future is going to hold. You hear me? You know we can do the right things for the wrong reasons? We can even do biblical things for the wrong reason. God isn't just concerned about our external actions. God's concerned about our hearts. He's concerned about our minds. He's concerned about the way we think and we feel. Because the great things of the kingdom of God, things like joy and peace, they're internal. They have to do with what's going on up here and what's going on in here. And you know where fear resides? Here and here. And God wants us to have hearts and minds that are shaped like him. And I tell you what, of all things, I don't know everything about God, but I know this. He is without fear. 
And he wants us to be the same. Listen to me. Fearless comes from who, not what. Fear come, fearless comes not from knowing the what, but knowing the who. So what we're going to do here in a second is I'm going to have everybody, North, South Campus, people online, we're going to read aloud together the 23rd Psalm. Before we do it, I want to lay a challenge before you. My challenge is that over the course of the next several weeks, you memorize the 23rd Psalm. I mean, likelihood is you know parts of it. At least the parts on your coffee mug, your wall hanging, whatever, you know a piece of it. But I'm telling you, this is something we need to get deep inside of our spirit. As we read it aloud together, ask yourself, does it talk about the what or the who? Real simple. You ready? We're going to do it out loud together. Psalm 23, starting in verse 1. Do it with me out loud. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And the people of God said, Amen. Did it talk about what or did it talk about who? There's not a bit of information in the 23rd Psalm. To be honest with you, not a whole lot in the Bible about the what of the future. But a lot about the who. First week, Easter weekend, we talked about verse 1. Last week, Pastor Jake did just an incredible job on verse number 2. Verse 3, it starts, he restores my soul. Notice this word restores. Notice it's not in the past tense. The word restore is in the present tense. It doesn't say he restored my soul at one point and the rest of it's on me. It's not just something God did in the past. He restores present tense. So think about it. If you read Psalm 23.3 a year from now, it's still in the present tense. It's in the present tense for that day. A year from now, if Jesus has not returned, that verse will still be present tense for that day. Why? Because God has already prepared for our future failures and mistakes. It has to do with being a shepherd. Those acquit, intimately acquainted with sheep know that sheep have this tendency that what the old English called to become cast, C-A-S-T, cast sheep. Get the image of a sheep that's rolled on its back like a turtle and can't flip itself up. They've fallen and they can't get up. That happens honestly more often to sheep than we know. And if they're on their back, they can't get up. They're very susceptible to predators and they're very susceptible to the elements. This can happen to even some of the most healthy of sheep. This happens often because sheep look for a soft spot. They look for like a hollow that they can get in. They kind of start to roll around. And sometimes that hollow is more deep than they thought. And what? They find themselves on their back when they don't expect it. Other times, sheep have too much wool. The purpose of a sheep is to give wool. That wool has to come off. But if they have too much wool, then they get stuff embedded in it. They get debris and mud and burrs and things like that. And when that happens, they become heavy and a little overweight. And they can easily become cast and become very vulnerable. You know, when it comes to our faith journey, we're often like sheep. We all like sheep, the scripture says, have gone astray. Let's be honest, we look for the soft spots, don't we? I mean, we're Americans, nothing wrong with that, but Americans were trained to go for the easiest path possible. And sometimes going the easiest path possible makes us vulnerable. Let's be honest, sometimes we don't engage in Christian community in one of our groups because you go to a group, those people know you. I mean, in a room like this, room like our North Campus, if you're at home by yourself online right now, people don't have to get to know my life, they don't get my business. But if you get in a group, it's kind of risky, it's kind of vulnerable if people get in our business. Or we don't pursue biblical knowledge because I have to think. I have to think differently than I've thought before. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy. See, we can look for the path of least resistance in our faith. And in doing so, just like a sheep, we can become cast, vulnerable, and in places of pain. Or we, like a sheep, don't live out our purposes. The purpose of a sheep is to give its wool. But if we don't live out our purposes, we just take and take and take. We just become fat. 
in our faith. And that actually makes us vulnerable. Listen to me. I think many of us are fearful of the future. Because even though we don't know what tomorrow holds, we know in the days to come something's going to happen. I'm going to mess up. I am going to fail. I'm going to do something foolish. I'm going to screw up. I don't, I don't want to, but I am. And many among us, probably many that are children of God, have this thought about God. That, yeah, he restored my soul, and he told me the way I'm supposed to live, and it's up to me to live the way that I'm supposed to live. And if I fail or when I fail, then God has to get disgusted at me. He's got to get fed up. He's got to become even furious in my life. And if there's a future where God is angry at us because I have messed up, that future is very frightening, is it not? Man, I can remember growing up as a kid, my parents were old school because, like, I grew up in old school days, you know? And mama, sometimes my brother and I would press my mama really hard. And then she had a phrase that struck fear into us. She didn't use it all the time, but she'd get that look in her eyes that she was done. But when she said she was done, she didn't just tear into us what she'd looked. She said, you just wait till your daddy gets home. <laughs> was I afraid of the future when she said that? Absolutely. You say, why? Because if mama ain't happy, ain't no one happy. And if daddy comes home and mama ain't happy, he is going to make those who made her not happy more unhappy than she is, Right? That was the reality of life. And deep within us, when I talked about Jesus coming back, Maranatha, some are saying, I, I, I don't know. Because we see the return of Jesus like that. You wait till your daddy gets home. Why? Because I know the person in the mirror. I know my failures. I know my mistakes. I know what goes on in here that no one else sees. And he knows. And because of that, we wonder, how's he really going to see us? To the reality of future failure, God speaks. He restores my soul. A good shepherd daily looks for cast sheep. Jesus told the parable of having a hundred sheep. One of them is lost. He leaves the 99. I don't think he didn't leave them by themselves. He left them with someone to watch them, and he went searching for the one. He scours the horizons. Are there vultures already cir circling that are looking for their next meal? And maybe that's where his sheep is. He begins to listen for the cry of a fallen sheep, and he moves quickly, not to punish, not to kill, not to destroy. He moves quickly so that he can do what? He restores my soul. One of the greatest revelations of God that we can have is that of a shepherd who is looking for sheep that are cast down and need to be restored. Now, again, don't mishear me. Will God one day punish sin? Absolutely. Will the wrath of God be poured out on those who don't accept his restoration? Absolutely. Different than a fallen sheep that has become cast. When the shepherd comes to us, we've got to agree with him. We've got to repent We've got to say, God, I, I've messed up, but the Bible says if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just, not just to forgive our sins, but to purify us from all unrighteousness. He restores my soul. God will punish everyone who doesn't accept his restoration, but do not miss reality. The heart of God is to restore and give us a grand future in this life and in the life to come. I mean, come on, if God just wanted to destroy, if he just wanted to punish, he would have never sent Jesus Christ. But through Jesus, listen to me, he has taken care of our failures. The failures I once had. The failures that I made this morning. Come on, isn't it interesting what happens trying to get to church on Sunday? Yep. And he has already made plans for my tomorrow. He restores my soul. Listen to me, none of us want to fail. None of us plan to fall, but even the healthiest of sheep can become cast. But listen, we do not have to fear. God has already planned for our failures. His love is greater than our, than our failures. Our failures are not greater than his patience, his love, and restoration. Listen to the word, Psalm 23, 3. He, somebody say he. 
a who, not a what. He restores my soul. Fearless comes from who, not what. The second part of verse 3. You remember it? See, you already had a test right there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. He leads me to the right path. Sheep are known to be creatures of great habit. And they will do this. They will just walk the same path over and over again. They'll dig ruts into it. They'll keep going to the same pasture. Even when the pasture no longer has grass in it, anything to graze, they'll keep going to try to graze that because that's the nature of what they do. They'll just get in a rut and they'll keep going in that rut even if it's killing them. Sound like anybody else you know? The only way they change paths to go to places that lead to life is if they have a shepherd who will continually guide them on the right paths. Right paths lead to good pasture. Good pasture leads to life. So it's interesting when Jesus, talking about himself, said, I am the door of the sheep. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and what? Find pasture. And then he defines the idea of pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they, they is who my sheep may have life and have it abundantly. The story is told of a man who was being guided in an African safari. And they were going through the jungle and the guy was just using his machete to whack a path in front of them. They had gone for hours and the tourist, man, he was getting frustrated. He had no idea where they were. He had no idea what was going on. And finally, he began to look at the guy in front of him and said, where are we? Do you know where you're taking me? Do you know the path? Can you show me the path? And the seasoned African guide just turned around with utter confidence and said, I am the path. Let's be honest. Most of us, if we were to ask about what we want for the future, do we want a guide or a map? And I bet most of us want a map. We want a map of the path. In fact, we don't even just want a map. What we want is what we get in our directional apps on our phone. I plug in a destination from point A to point B, and you know what Google Maps, what Waze, what Apple Maps gives me? It gives me multiple options. Multiple ways I can go that all get me to the same place and I get to choose which way I go. I decide the path. We don't want someone to lead us. But here is the reality of what Jesus offers. Jesus doesn't give us a map of the what for the days to come and then leave us on our own to do it. He gives us a who. A shepherd who not only guides us but empowers us, protects us, and is with us. Many of us are fearful of the future because in practicality, we keep looking for the map. We kind of keep coming to church, whatever form we're engaging, and we're looking for a path. We need someone to lead us. It's the way we were designed and until we are willing to embrace the guidance of the shepherd, we will have fear regarding the future. I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to show you the opening video again. Because I think it's a great image. But this time, I want you to do something. I want you to pay careful, careful attention to the details. Take a look. David Brown, the reigning world champion, goes in lane three alongside Jerome Avery, the former international sprinter for the United States. I ran with him our first practice. Coach immediately said, you're going to run with him after me. And, you know, the rest has been history. Ah! Here you go. Drive, 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 drive. Stay here tight. Running with Jerome, I don't have to worry about going out too far. All I have to focus on is just listening to him. Get up. Nice. Arm action should be exact. 
we should be hitting the ground at the same time. This time they're away and Brown gets away very, very well indeed. You see his run? we like one person. It should look like one person running. That's it. That tracking side on camera is magic to watch because it just shows that they were running almost like one person. Did you notice? They had a band that tied them together. Something that held them close to each other. Jesus said something similar. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What would it feel like as we look to tomorrow and next year and a decade from now if Jesus tarries? And what we had deep within is rest. Does this not feel like the opposite of fear? Take my yoke upon you. What does a yoke do? A yoke binds me with Jesus. Like a band. And I have to stay in step with him. Learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you from that will find rest for your souls. Did you hear what the runner with impaired vision said? He said, I don't have to worry. All I have to do is listen to him. Jesus said, when the shepherd has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. What if we just got ourselves in a place where we so knew the voice of God? Does it take effort? Does it take time? Yeah. But what if we just got to the place where that was the totality of our faith? Did you hear both runners in the video say, it, it, it should look like one person running? The scripture makes an amazing statement. Since life is found by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What if I got so close to Jesus that it just looked like one? Where would that place me? And did you notice the visually impaired runner? He's in the blocks. And the gun sounds. And without hesitation, he took off with everything that he has. He runs like someone who can see. He runs as one who is fearless. Not because he knows anything about what's in front of him, but because he has absolute confidence in the one with whom he runs. It is a great image of how we are to live life. It is the way we are designed to live life. I contend it is the way Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden until they sinned. And then they sinned and they hid from God. And they tried to do the next moments of life on their own. And the shame led to fear and fear was overwhelming. The entirety of our faith journey is just to get as close to Jesus as we can and stay in step with him. Guys, that's, that's why I think we should have corporate worship as frequently as possible. That's why I'm a big proponent for it. It's not to say, whoo, I went to church today. The goal isn't to say I went to church. The goal is to yoke. I just want to get yoked back with Jesus and I want to stay step with him. It's why I think we all need to be in a group because it's God using each other to hear his voice. And I'm just telling you, we need each other to hear the voice of God. It's why I think we need regular disciplines in our lives, scripture reading, prayer and such. Not so that we can check something off the list and say we did something religious to make God happy. I just want to stay in step with Jesus. I want to learn of him. I want to know him. And as we do that, as we just live our lives, staying in step with Jesus, we can run fearlessly in life, not because we know what the future holds, not because there's any indication of tomorrow. He's not going to give us something like a horoscope. He's not going to tell us what happens 10 years from now. He's going to say, run with me. I hold the future. And I will take care of you. We don't have to be those who fear. As the old timers used to say in a statement that became trite, but just because it came trite doesn't mean it's not true. We don't know what the future holds, 
but we know who holds the future. And fearless will come, listen to me, as we just stay close to him. I'll confess to you, I got a long way to go. It is so easy to forget about these moments that we have here and just start doing life. I I don't intend to. But Jesus lived this way. Jesus went to a place where there was virtually a hospital. The pools of Bethesda. You can read it in John chapter 5. And he healed one man among dozens. Other times Jesus healed everyone, but this time he healed one man. And he was confronted on why he was healing, especially on the Sabbath because of religious rules and stuff like that. And he simply said, I do what I see the Father doing. That's it. We're together. We're one. What he does, I do. What he doesn't do, I don't do. He goes this way, I go with him. If he goes right, I go right. If he goes left, I go left. If he stops, I stop. If he runs with total abandon forward, I run. That's where I want to be. I'm 56 years old, and I will tell you, after 43 years of following Jesus, I feel like I should be further along than I am in that. And I can beat myself up for that, or I can just say, God, I, I, I don't know where I'm supposed to be. I just know where I want to go. The Apostle Paul says, I, I forget the things that are behind, and I press on to that which is ahead, that I might take hold of all God has called me heavenward to be in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to look forward, and I'm going to say, Jesus, I want to learn to walk with you more than I ever have. I know I feel like I'm a long way from it, but get me closer. Because I know this, I know as I go in the future, you're going to restore my soul. That's who you are. I know you are going to guide me, lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And my invitation to you is to join us. Just to join in right now. We're going to have, after we conclude here, not the conclusion of service, we're going to have songs of worship. We use songs of worship to draw near to God. We are making confessions with our mouth of the truths of God, but we get to draw near to Him. I implore you, don't sing songs. Don't just go through the motion. Draw near. If you're at home, stand up. Join in. If you've got one of those great sound systems that we all have, turn it up. Join in. Be a part of it. I'm just going to tell you, he is going to guide us to pasture and to life. That is the promise. And you say, how can I know that? Will it always be easy? No, because sometimes he guides you through the valley of the shadow of death. Our least favorite verse of Psalm 23. We're going to talk about that next week. Show up anyway. Let's do this. Let's bow our heads for a moment before we worship. Just be honest right now. Maybe maybe you can say, not all of us share the same kinds of fears. Some of us fear being expendable like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Some of us talk about fear of want and lack like we talked about last week. But some of us, we have anticipatory anxiety. We can label it now. It's okay to label it and confess it. It's okay not to be okay here. It's just not okay to stay out not okay. I'm not going to stay not okay. And if you say, God, I just want some grace. I want grace to not walk in anticipatory anxiety. I confess to you, I have a fear of the things that are coming. I fear when I think about my kids and the future they're going to live in. I think of of the future of my grandkids and I think of fear. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to teach my kids and my grandkids to stay in step with the one who holds the future. And their future will be one where they find pasture, they find life, and have it abundant. Jesus has been leading people to places of abundant life for centuries now. He will not fail my grandkids. He will not fail my kids. I'm going to hold to that. That's where I want to be. If you want to say right now, God, I confess. I just want to confess I have a fear of the future with all that happens, and I want to ask for your forgiveness, and I want you to purify me from this place of unrighteousness. Put your hand up right now and say, God, that is me. I get it. Man, I can fall prey to this so much. Yeah, you can put your hands down. And for all of us, if you just want to say, Jesus, 
I want to stay more in step with you than I ever have. I want to be bound to you, yoked to you. I don't want to have to worry about life. I just want to listen for your voice. I want people to look at my life. I want to get to a place where they think it's like, that, that dude's one with Jesus. That woman, she's one with Jesus. That seems so impossible. But that's where I want to be. If you want to take steps forward, to stay in step with Jesus and in stride with him, put your hand up right now. Say, Jesus, give me that grace. Father, that is what we pray together right now. I speak over the men and women who are engaged today, wherever we might be in the world. I speak over men and women that you are one who restores our soul. You have planned for our weaknesses. You have planned for our struggles. You have planned for our failures and our screw-ups. You restore our soul. So we say we trust you. We don't want to fail. We want strength to walk strong, to be perfect, even as you who have called us is perfect. But we also know reality that if we say we are without sin, we are a liar and your truth is not in us. And so we ask, oh God, that we could trust you for your restoration in the days to come. We will not fear the future, but we also say, God, we want to be guided wherever you might lead us, Lord. I don't want to be comfortable where I am. Forgive us where we've gotten into a rut. And it, it was a life-giving path at one point, but maybe there's a new path you've called us to. Just let us be sensitive to the places and the ways you might be leading us. Different seasons of life, different stations, and let us be ones who say yes to you. Give us grace more than we ever have to walk with you. And we renounce, oh God, fear. Perfect love, your word says, cast out all fear. And so let us draw near to you and your love, and it will push away our fear. We love you. And Father, we pray that you find pleasure and joy in the love we express in our worship here. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's give worship to God.